This lecture will concentrate on prenatal development. Um, it is kind of a lengthy chapter. Uh, we're going to start off with genetics um, and talk about some uh, conditions that are associated with uh, genetic mutations and um, uh, chromosomal issues, and then end with some uh, fertility uh, problems that men and women commonly face. Um, so it is kind of a lengthy chapter. I just want to give you a forewarning before we start. Uh, one of the areas uh, that has uh, really grown in the last um, few decades has been genetics. Genetics is the field of biology that studies heredity. Um, and this all started by an Austrian monk by the name of Gregor Mendel. Uh, Gregor Mendel was uh, fascinated by botany and um, began his experiment um, quite by accident uh, with pea plants. Now, before Gregor Mendel, uh, if two individuals um, that, let's say, had both had uh, brown hair, brown eyes, with absolutely no genetic, they were not carriers for any of the recessive uh, light eyes or light hair. If they had um, a child and their child was blonde hair, blue eyes, uh, before Gregor Mendel, the idea was that everything is divine intervention. So if they had a blonde baby, if they had an Asian baby, if they had an uh, African baby, um, that was out, what we know today is out of their genetic pool, it would be considered genetic, uh, divine intervention. They would go to the local priest and local priest would send them home uh, saying, you know, that God wanted it, that God wanted your child this way, go home and raise your baby. Well, today we know what, uh, what the real deal is. And we can thank that, uh, thank the discovery to Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel started an experiment with pea plants where he crossbred two pea plants that were dichotomous in their nature, meaning they only had, his was white, yellow, and green peas, and they mixed them up together, and he got offsprings. And uh, the book does an excellent job of um, kind of going through this, uh, his experiment. From this pea plant experiment, there's Gregor Mendel, came the idea of dominant traits and recessive traits. Um, so if you take a genetic class, they'll talk about uh, Mendelian genetics. That's uh, what they're saying. We know two individuals with two dominant genes uh, will have, their child will have, will exhibit those dominant genes. In order for a child to have uh, a recessive gene, both it has to inherit that recessive gene. For example, if uh, a mother is a carrier for sickle cell anemia, which is a recessive trait, um, in order for the child to have it, the father also has to be uh, a carrier, and in that chance, the, the baby has a chance of carrying. So these are ideas that all came from um, Mendel, and then we have genes that are polygenetic. It's not just one or two. Their combination of genes are giving, uh, exhibiting those traits. So we know traits are determined by a pair of genes. Each one of the pair is alleles, so you put it together. It's a pair of alleles that are giving certain uh, traits. When an individual has two identical alleles, whether it's two recessive, two dominant, the person is homozygous, homo meaning the same, two identical alleles for that trait. They're homozygous for that trait. When the individual has two different alleles, so a dominant and a recessive, they are heterozygous for that trait. We know in dominant trait, all you need is one of the alleles to be dominant, and what is expressed is the dominant trait. However, for a recessive trait to be expressed, the person has to inherit both, has to be homozygous for that trait. So someone with blue eyes has, has to be, uh, have both recessive traits in order to express uh, that specific trait. So we have dominant gene, dominant traits and some recessive traits. You can pause or come back to this um, to see the examples of some of the characteristics. 
So we know human life in terms of a cell growing is simply the gametes coming together. So all them, uh, ovum and sperm are your gametes, male and female. When they come together, they create the first cell, which is a zygote. Please remember the word zygote because you'll see this word being played on, homozygous, heterozygous. For twins, we call them monozygotic, dizygotic. So this word zygote, the first cell created, um, has been kind of played on um, quite often in this field. So with one sperm, one egg coming together, you have a combination of over two billion chemically coded message. That's enough to create an entire human. So one cell carries 23 pair of chromosomes. So you get 23 from the egg, 23 from the sperm. So all together, each cell carries 46 chromosome, which has 25,000 uh, genes in it. So your chromosomes are these rod shaped structures that each segment is a, maybe a gene for certain characteristics. You find these chromosomes within the nuclei in the center of each cell. Gene is a basic unit. I'm gonna show you a picture in a minute, a basic unit of heredity composed of specific DNAs, which are your material. Uh, that is a double helix uh, composed of phosphates and sugar, um, sugars and their bases. So here you have a cell. In the center of the cell, you have the nucleus. Within the nucleus, you have your chromosomes. If you, so there's the 46 chromosomes, right? So if you take this chromosome and you stretch it out, just one tiny segment of it, you see the material that is built, the DNA, and the gene is a segment of that DNA. So this segment, this gene, may be responsible for your hair structure. This gene may be responsible for your eye color. So gene is a segment on the chromosome. Um, I think that, sorry. So we know humans have 23 pairs of chromosome, right? So you get 23 from the egg, 23 from the sperm. They have actually outlined from the first to the 23rd chromosome. From the first to the 22nd chromosome, these are called autosomes because they look exactly the same, whether you get it from the egg or the sperm, not look the same, but they have the same um, length of information or same amount, uh, type of information. The 23rd chromosome, the last chromosome is super special. It is considered the sex chromosome because it will determine the sex of the baby. So if, you, if a uh, pregnant couple would like to find out the sex of the baby, one of the things they can do is a chromosomal um, testing, and they would specifically look at the 23rd chromosome to see whether it is an XX or an XY. So we know an X on the 23rd chromosome, an egg, I'm sorry, an egg on the 23rd chromosome always carries an X. A Y, a sperm, will either carry an X or a Y. So one sperm may carry an X, another one may carry an X carry a Y. Depending on which sperm penetrates this egg, you will either get an XX, so one X from the egg, one X from the sperm, and a female is produced. Uh, X from the egg and a Y from the sperm, then you have a male. So they have, again, looked at these chromosomes, and here we have the first, the 22nd, and the 23rd is what makes the sex of the baby. So a female has XX and a male has an XY, and this is coming from the sperm. Now, um, I'm gonna draw this for you. And we have uh, conditions that are, that are carried on the 23rd chromosome, such as colorblindness, Duchenne dystrophy, um, hemophilia, these conditions, these this genetic segments found on the 23rd chromosome tend to be found on the X chromosome. So X tends to be the carrier. However, most of the time, these sex chromosomal disorders are found in males. Why is that? 
So we know an X chromosome carries a significant amount of information. If you take this X and carry it out, just stretch out the genetic makeup, it's pretty long. When you have an XX, you have an X that let's say has um, color blindness in this segment, right? The second X, which is um, received from the sperm, carry, oops, sorry, I didn't mean that, carries the same amount of information, right? In terms of uh, the information, it should be exactly the same. So that this X, if we were to stretch it out, we'll see carries the same. So the X that we get from the egg, if this is color blindness, the X that we get from the Y is able to kind of erase or um, quiet down this uh, gene so that the female will not be colorblind. In the, wing, in the male, you have the X, which you get from the egg, right? That's normal. And here we have color blindness, let's say this segment. The Y chromosome, the reason it's called a Y, you can see it's significantly smaller. So the amount of information carried on the Y chromosome is significantly less. So this male, the Y chromosome would come, let's say, this far. There is no segment, genetic segment gene that can quiet this down. So this male is much more likely to show color blindness than this female. And we see color blindness more often in males than we do in females. Um, and that is one of the reasons. Hemophilia, which is actually a 23rd sex chromosomal disorder, that condition uh, which causes the child to basically, if, if they are cut, they're unable to create blood clot and they may uh, lead to death. That is carried on the X, but more expressed often in males. There are other chromosomal and genetic disorder. This uh, girl has Down syndrome, common features of Down syndrome, facial features. Uh, this is a famous actress. This uh, woman has Turner syndrome, and we'll take a look at that. And this male has what we call um, Kleinfelter syndrome, where uh, the male features uh, or stature that makes a male is uh, not commonly seen in these males. And we'll take a look at that in a second. So one of the common uh, chromosomal disorders is PKU. This ends, it's an uh, enzyme disorder. Um, not very common, one, one 8,000 infants are born with it. It is found on the, on the 12th chromosome. For these individuals, uh, their body cannot met met uh, metabolize an amino acid called phenylene. So what happens is when they eat food in this amino acid, instead of it being able to break down, it builds up, becomes toxic, and through the bloodstream goes to the central nervous system, the spinal cord, and especially the brain, and begins to uh, kill brain cells. So as a result of this toxicity and, and cell death, neural death, the results, the individual over time will um, have mental retardation, psychological disorder, and physical problems. That's the bad news. The good news is they do test kids for PKU infants um, in the hospital when they're born to make sure that they don't have PKU. If they do have PKU, then they are placed on a diet low in this amino acid and they can develop normally and be perfectly fine. Um, however, they will have uh, food restriction, diet restriction for the rest of their life because their body just cannot break down this amino acid. Um, other chromosomal disorder, Down syndrome, is uh, when there is an extra chromosome on the 21st chromosome. So what you have if you uh, do a chromosomal, uh, chromosomal uh, test, instead of 46 chromosome, you will find 47 chromosome, an extra chromosome on the 21st chromosome. Uh, this can, Down syndrome is also referred to as trisomy, tri meaning three, uh, three some uh, chromosome on the 21st chromosome, so trisomy 21. As a result of that extra chromosome on the 21st chromosome, the facial features of individuals with Down syndrome, rounded face, protruding tongue, broad, uh, flat nose, they have a sloping fold of skin over the inner corner of the eyes, um, those are their feature characteristics. 
Um, they also may suffer from cognitive development, motor development uh, issues, and um, commonly have heart conditions that are now absolutely treatable. So they are enjoying a longer life than uh, previous. So these are the common features you can see in the facial features. Uh, there's also in the hand, uh, single palm or uh, uh, short fifth finger that uh, turn inwards, uh, widely separated first and second toe, and increased skin pieces. So those are some of the um, physical features. Um, there's also a condition called sickle cell anemia, which is commonly found, uh, not commonly found, but those that carry it or tend to be more African-American. However, it is found in um, Latin American and Middle Eastern population, but more seen in African Americans. So, one in twenty, uh, one in ten African Americans are carriers for this. One in twenty Latino or Latina um, Americans also uh, are carriers for sickle cell anemia. This is caused by a recessive gene found on the eleventh chromosome, where the individual's red blood cells, instead of being nice and round, it takes a sickle shape. And uh, because as it's floating uh, through the bloodstream can cl uh, clump up and obstruct uh, small blood vessels, um, it decreases oxygen supply to the brain and other parts of the body. It can be extremely painful for the individual that suffers from uh, sickle cell. Lessens oxygen, unfortunately, to the brain can cause um, stroke-like symptoms, cognitive uh, skills issues physical problems, again, uh, painful swollen joints, jaundice, um, and it can be uh, fatal because uh, it causes conditions like pneumonia, stroke, heart, and kidney failure. Um, Huntington disease is one of the only dominant trait uh, conditions that have passed through humanity. One of the reasons for this, individuals who show symptoms are usually in middle adulthood. By then, they've already have kids and have passed that gene on. So um, if two, between two parents, one has Huntington disease um, because it's a dominant gene, the baby has a 50% chance of inheriting the gene. If the child gets the gene, they will develop the disease. And it is a fatal progressive degenerative disorder. Uh, this is a uh, disorder, it's a combination of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. So it's a movement condition where the individual will have uncontrollable muscle movement, um, tremors, uh, inability to control muscle uh, movement. Uh, but at the same time, it is also killing brain cells so that uh, psychological symptoms are loss of int uh, intellectual functioning and personality change. Uh, it is, they have found the gene responsible for this condition. It is found on the fourth chromosome. Um, and unfortunately, it is fatal. There are medicine that can help with the symptoms, but there is no cure as of yet for this condition. Um, then you have uh, sex-linked genetic abnormalities. These are found on the 23rd chromosome, most commonly carried on the X from the egg. Uh, so hemophilia is one where the individual cannot create blood clots and can bleed to death. Duchenne dis uh, muscular dystrophy is another one. Um, it is a recess there are recessive genes. So we talked about this already. Females with two X, two X chromosomes are less likely than males to show these six, um, sex-linked disorders because the X carries more information and can um, quiet down the, the X that is the carrier. Sons, however, are more likely to be afflicted. So uh, this is the XX and the XY. Um, other sex link disorders, uh, this is due to an extra X or an extra Y. Klinefelter is XXY. So these are males that have an extra X chromosome, one in 500 males. Um, and unfortunately, that extra X will uh, reduce the testosterone that normal males have. So during puberty, we quite often see these um, 
the issues with this disease show up. Um, the characteristic feature of maleness, right? The testes, deepening of the voice, musculature, and the male pattern of body hair do not develop properly for these males. Uh, unfortunately, most of these males tend to be um, infertile because of little to no uh, sperm production. Uh, if it is caught soon enough, um, you can treat it before the male hits puberty and can really reduce some of these um, side effects. But it is treated with testosterone replacement therapy. The other sex-linked uh, disorder is a single X. So the second sex chromosome is missing for these individuals. And because you don't have the Y, you uh, by default have a female. So one in 2,500 females suffer from this where there's an, a single X chromosome. Um, these infants at birth may seem normal, extra genitalia are normal. However, especially during puberty, ovaries are poorly developed. There's a little estrogen that's produced. Um, these females tend to be shorter than average and uh, most likely will be infertile. Um, there, there may be some cognitive deficits also associated with this, although with hormonal therapy it may be resolved. Um, problems with visual spatial skills, mathematics, nonverbal memory. So in Kleinfelter, this is quite often the males are um, missing that male pattern uh, musculature growth. And for females with uh, Turner syndrome, they tend to be shorter, uh, some heart issues, and uh, other common features. So we know the genetic disorders, how do we detect, um, how can we detect these um, conditions? Amniocentesis is a test commonly performed on mothers after 35. They actually recommend mothers after 35, especially after 40, to take amniocentesis. It is performed uh, in 14 to 16 weeks after conception. So a syringe uh, withdraws fluid uh, from the amniotic sac, they go through the uh, stomach cavity into the amniotic sac and draw some of those amniotic fluid that have cells um, um, floating uh, by the fetus. Um, cells are separated, they're grown in culture and examined for uh, genetic and chromosomal issues. Again, after 35, um, recommended especially after 40 because of an increased risk for Down syndrome. Um, amniocentesis does absolutely carry some risks, although minimal, uh, of miscarriage. It's unlikely, but it could happen. So here you have, and it, apparently, um, it is not as bad as it looks, but they do put a long needle through the stomach cavity and draw amniotic fluid out. They usually do an ultrasound also to make sure uh, to guide the needle um, where it's supposed to go. Then they do a cell culture and uh, look at uh, the chromosomal makeup of the cell. CVS, another drugstore, but chorionic villus sampling um, can be carried out. Can be carried out as young as early as eight weeks uh, during pregnancy, but coming into nine to twelve weeks of pregnancy. Um, this one is a little bit more intrusive. They're going through the vagina into the uterus to take out some of these uh, villi uh, projections from the outer membrane. Um, and those cells will also provide you information about the chromosome, chromosomal issues, if there are any with the offspring. Um, what's amazing about this test, whereas with amniotic amniocentesis, uh, it may take up to two weeks. This one, the results will come back in a few days. CVS is more expensive, so a lot of insurance companies will not do it as a routine. It has to be a high-risk pregnancy. It also carries a higher risk uh, than uh, amniocentesis. Um, so it's not commonly uh, used. So here you have a catheter that is sent. These villi are sucked up, um, and the cells are uh, analyzed for any chromosomal issues. Ultrasound is the most commonly used one. Um, sound waves that are high in frequency um, is projected into the 
amniotic sac with the offspring, those sound waves will bounce off the fetus and will give you a picture, um, as we know, it's called a sonogram, right? Um, and it's used for a variety of reasons. Uh, ultrasounds can be used for amniocentesis, uh, amniocentesis as well as CBS, but it also is fantastic for detecting multiple pregnancies, um, track the growth of the fetus to make sure um, structurally the, baby, the offspring is uh, normal and how big the baby's head will be for delivery, whether to do a C-section uh, or episiotomy or uh, normal, normal delivery, or I should say vaginal delivery. Um, blood tests are also used. Those are commonly used to detect sickle cell anemia, Tay-Sachs, and cystic fibrosis. Uh, what they're doing is det they're detecting this protein, AFP alpha fatal protein, uh, to see if the, there's any neural, to uh, neural tube defects, such as spina bifida and chromosomal abnormalities. It's not uncommon to do a, uh, to do a blood test uh, that may indicate some abnormality, and they follow it up with an amniocentesis or a CBS, and the fetus is growing just fine. So it has, unfortunately, more false positives associated with it, which may turn out to be not, not an important uh, or not a risk factor. AFPs, high, elevated AFPs are also related to increased risk of fetal death. So um, it does give some indication. In terms of heredity and environment, um, we know we inherit many of our characteristics from the egg and the sperm. However, that's not enough to predict the overall health uh, of the baby. We know mother's nutrition prenatally, um, what she does exercising subsequently for the offspring, their nutrition, all of that may contribute to uh, one's development of traits. Um, please make sure you know these two terminology. You will see that in this class. Genotype are a set of traits we inherit, inherit from our parents. Um, many of your genotypes you may not even know you have. You're just carriers for these traits. Uh, phenotypes are the ones that are expressed. Those are actual set of traits that are expressed. So you may be a carrier for a recessive, uh, lighter color eye. But if we look at your phenotype, what we see are brown, brown eyes. Uh, phenotype for things like um, intelligence, height, are both genetic and environmental influences in terms of the expressed traits. Uh, one of the more fascinating things uh, about this prenatal development is a whole idea of twins. Um, identical twins are um, created from one egg, one sperm. So this, that single zygote, that when the gametes come together, from the egg and the sperm creates one cell, the single cell, which is the zygote. Uh, from that comes identical twins. So somehow in their replication, duplication, you create two separate human beings. So identical twins or monozygotic twins, mono meaning one, monozygotic twins, um, you have to use, well, genetically, there are either two X's or two Y's because you only have one sperm. So you usually have an identical twin, two boys or two girls. Dizygotic, di meaning two, uh, commonly referred to as fraternal twins. These are from two eggs and two sperm. So it's kind of having a sibling group at the same time, I grow. Um, fraternal twins, dizygotic twins. Uh, they could... Each of these twins could have same placenta or separate placenta. Uh, more commonly though, identical twins have the same placenta and dizygotic twins have separated placenta, but that doesn't have to be uh, always that way. We know with uh, a rate of uh, multiple birth has increased over the years. A lot of uh, research is showing that maybe because women are, are putting off having kids later in life, and as you age, especially after 40, the chances of having dizygotic twins uh, increases because the woman is ovulating uh, at a faster rate uh, than uh, the younger years. So 
Um, this is anatomy of female reproductive organs. You have the uh, ovaries here, which contain all your eggs at birth. Uh, these immature uh, ovums, well, one of them will be chosen um, to mature, and every 28 days, you're releasing a mature ovum uh, into uh, the fallopian tube. If, and this small thing is a sperm, if the sperm penetrates, you have a zygote, the first cell is created, and as this uh, zygote travels down the fallopian tube, it is replicating, duplicating, until it becomes a group of cells called blastocysts. It's about um, 60 to 90 cells that ultimately will make a human being, or turn into a human being. Um, as the, this blastocyst is traveling down uh, into the uterus, it will implant itself, attach itself into the uterine wall, and will begin to grow. So this is an egg that is uh, being attacked, uh, a better word for it, but being surrounded uh, by a sperm. And once one sperm gets chosen to enter and release its um, chemical uh, information, those 23 chromosomes, the first cell is created and a zygote is created. The field has divided up uh, prenatal development into these three stages. Uh, germinal, some uh, schools of study will call it zygotic stage, which goes from the moment the egg and the sperm meet to about two weeks through implantation. The second stage is called embryonic stage, which is from the time of implantation until the end of the eighth week. And fetal is really from the ninth week to birth, which is a full-term pregnancy is uh, 40 weeks, although uh, 38, 39 is also considered. So starting off with the first stage, uh, germinal stage, this is really the shortest stage of the pregnancy. The fertilized egg is now called the blastocyst. You have 60 to 90 um, cells that will ultimately turn into the human being. This group of cells are traveling down the fallopian tube and attaching itself into the urine wall. We call this implantation, literally attaching and burrowing into the urine wall so that it can um, get nourishment from the host and grow. Um, with division comes cell specialization that one single cell, the zygote, will ultimately turn into who you are. So you have cells that create the blood vessels, the brain, uh, spinal cord, et cetera. So you need that spe cell specialization to create uh, what is needed. That one single cell will also create the support tissues to grow the uh, individual. So you have the placenta that's created and umbilical cord. The placenta is a organ tissue um, that allows the mother's blood to be separated from the growing fetus. So its job is to bring in nutrition um, from the host and gets that nutrition, whatever is needed, gets uh, carried to the offspring through the umbilical cord. Umbilical cord is this long uh, vein that carries food in or nutrition in and uh, is surrounded by two smaller vessels that take waste out of the growing, uh, growing organism. Um, um, umbilical cord is actually pretty astounding. It's, uh, it can be anywhere from one to three feet long, so uh, the supper is pretty, pretty amazing in what it does and how long it is. Um, the germinal stage, again, ends when plantation happens. So when the, uh, that group of cells have burrowed itself nicely into the urine wall, uh, we are entering the next stage, which we'll call embryonic stage. So blastocysts um, are separate group of cells that ultimately will become the fetus, the individual. Trophoblasts are outer, those uh, four membranes that ultimately will um, 
become nourishment and support for the growing fetus. So one will produce blood cells, then it disappears when the organism can do it for itself. One develops into the umbilical cord and blood vessels of the placenta. One will develop into the amniotic sac, and one will become the chorion, which will bind the placenta. So from the time of implantation uh, to the end of the eighth week, uh, one has entered the embryonic stage, uh, and thus the growing organism is now called the embryo. What's amazing about this stage is that major organs such as the brain and spinal cord and the heart are growing first and fast during this time. And you have these three layers um, that ultimately will become uh, their own set of structures. You have the ectoderm. Uh, this layer will become the skin, hair, teeth, sense organ, and most importantly, the brain and the spinal cord. Endoderm, the more inner uh, layer, will become the digestive system, liver, pancreas, and respiratory system, and much more, but these are some of the examples. And the middle layer, which is the mesoderm, will become muscle, uh, bones, uh, blood, and the circulatory system. So we, we just mentioned that the head, brain, and spinal cord, and the heart uh, are forming rapidly. The, during this phase, the heart will begin to um, beat. Major organs are developing within the first two months, really. Arm buds and legs appear by the end of the first month. Ears, eyes, ears, nose, mouth is taking form. A nervous system and the brain are beginning to develop. During the second month, a nervous system begins to send messages. So those um, cells that are created are beginning to communicate. The embryo is about one inch uh, long and weighs about one thirtieth of an ounce. And you may see teeth bud forming by the end of the stage. Um, at about five to six weeks, uh, internal external genitals resemble exactly the same. So if you were to do ultrasound, you would think it's a primitive female structure. It may not be, and the video that we've embedded will kind of go through this. By the seventh week, whether you got the X or the Y, so whatever genetic code was given to the offspring, it will begin to assert itself. Although you can't see it really well, but um, changes are occurring in order to create a male or a female. So genetic activity on the Y chromosome specifically will um, cause the testes to differentiate. That gene is called SRY. Ovaries will um, begin to differentiate if there's no Y. So I've heard people say we're all female at birth. We are not, we're dimorphic. Uh, but if the Y doesn't do what it's supposed to, then it doesn't create that SRY doesn't do what it's supposed to, then a female is created. Um, the third and the longest stage is uh, the fetal stage. Uh, we're calling the organism the fetus. Um, and whatever has started prior is beginning to differentiate and mature. So organs become more differentiated, are beginning to work. Uh, the brain parts and body parts are becoming more specialized, connecting, uh, communicating at this point. The fetus can open and shut their eyes, they can suck their thumb at, at the end of the second trimester. Um, it's gaining about five and a half pounds and doubling in length. By the seventh month, uh, because of gravity and the head being the heaviest part, the fetus is turned upside down, um, which gets it ready for delivery. And it's doubling in its weight by the seventh month. There is an age of viability meaning if the baby is born, um, it can make it. Uh, we know 90% survival if uh, the fetus is born at the end of the seventh month and given uh, quality of care. However, uh, because of technology, they are putting age of viability, meaning if the baby is born, uh, it can survive as early as 20, between 23 to about 26 months, 20 weeks, I'm sorry, 20, uh, 
26 weeks. So you can see in terms of body proportion, uh, we are growing into our head. The head is the first place to develop two months after conception. The head is pretty well developed. And by the time the baby is born, it, it's growing into his head more than um, earlier. There are some environmental factors that will influence us that will affect prenatal development. Uh, maternal malnutrition has a huge impact on the growing fetus. Um, and people think malnutrition means the mother is skinny. That's not the case at all. Um, we have had women who uh, are very, very healthy and have maybe been considered overweight. Um, and they are malnutrition because they are eating uh, food or lacking, eating food that lacks nutrition like fast foods. Um, so what we've seen for their offspring, unfortunately, is low birth weight, uh, which is never good. Uh, prematurity, they're at a higher risk of premature birth, retardation of brain development, and cognitive deficits, behavioral problems, cardiovascular diseases. Those are the bad news. The good news is fetal malnutrition can um, be overcome sometimes be overcome by uh, environmental um, support. Uh, we know today there's been way too many studies that uh, are pretty consistently showing women who take their supplemental uh, vitamins and whatever supplement is given, uh, it absolutely has positive effects on motor development of infants. And interestingly enough, maternal obesity has been uh, linked with higher risk of stillbirths. So um, that can also be an issue. Theoretically, women are supposed to gain 25 to 30, 35 pounds during their pregnancy. Um, those who may have um, already had a head start don't need to gain as much. And those who are a little bit behind and slender may gain a little bit more. But on average, it's about 25 pounds. 35 pounds. So we have studied women and the effect of women's activity and behavior on the growing off, uh, offspring. Well, we know fathers also play a role. Older fathers are more likely to produce abnormal sperm. And what that means, older fathers increase the risk of the offspring having issues like schizophrenia, autism, especially if they're genetic carriers of those, uh, and other issues. Uh, for women, 20s is the ideal time, mid-20s, the ideal time for bearing children in terms of the health of the egg and the uterus and such. Unfortunately, um, risk for stillbirth and premature babies increase as the mother age increases, um, but adequate prenatal care can decrease this um, risk factor. This is just age-wise, what uh, some of the risk factors and infertility for women. <coughs> we have environmental um, dangers called teratogens. This is anything in the environment that can cause harm to the growing fetus. So we know all of the illegal drugs um, are considered teratogens, uh, poll air pollution, x-rays, um, and what we don't pay attention to is stress can be teratogens for the growing fetus. You also have pathogens, these disease-causing organisms uh, that can also uh, cause havoc for the growing fetus, bacteria, viruses, beyond. So some of these teratogens, alcohol is probably the most commonly used um, drug, uh, unfortunately and it can uh, cause fetal alcohol syndrome, or if you can't really see the effects of alcohol, it can cause what we call fetal alcohol effects. So fetal alcohol uh, syndrome babies uh, often tend to be smaller with smaller brains, and there are absolutely facial features that you don't really see with the, uh, fetal alcohol effects, but you do see the cognitive effects um, and brain uh, issues with fetal alcohol. Psychological characteristics appear to reflect dysfunction of the brain, the inability to multi uh, do tasks that take multiple steps, uh, commonly seen with kids with FAS, uh, impulse 
uh, control issues, poor judgment, distractibility. These are all um, psychological uh, side effects of AFS. So a AFS features, um, eyes wide apart, flattening of the nose. If you look at the upper lip, is that, uh, there's no crease. You know, that bump that we usually have is flattened out with an extremely thin upper lips, uh, quite often seen uh, with FAS. The most devastating, devastating part of this condition, however, is the brain development. So uh, this, these are two week, six week babies. One it has been exposed to alcohol prenatally and you can see how significantly smaller it is than a, what's considered a healthy developing baby. Um, other drugs, we know nicotine has devastating effect, has carbon monoxide, hydrocarbon, the stars that can pass through the placenta and create havoc. Um, it decreases that carbon monoxide, decreases the oxygen available to fetus, which by itself can uh, cause issues. Babies uh, who come from smoker, especially mothers, tend to be smaller, uh, increased risk of stillbirth or premature baby. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, babies right after birth can uh, die from uh, issues. Men who produce, uh, who smoke can also uh, uh, produce abnormal sperm, especially seen with marijuana smokers. Um, babies of uh, fathers who smoke have higher rates of birth defects, uh, infant mortality, lower birth weight, and cardiovascular problems. So, um, and that's, uh, I'm not quite clear if these are fathers who are smoking and the mother is next to them while they're going through the pregnancy or simply a sperm that has been exposed to uh, smoke is difficult to detect. You have pathogens. These are those uh, viruses, bacterial, uh, bacteria that can uh, enter a growing fetus's environment and again cause havoc. Syphilis is a dangerous one. HIV AIDS, we know what the devastation is, and rubella. So unfortunately, they, they, during the pregnancy, there can be issues uh, such as infertility. The most common cause of infer infertility for men or problems with infertility is low sperm count. That's the most common. Uh, lack of sperm, genetic factors, diabetes is a big one, environmental poisons, uh, pressure uh, from biopsies, overheating of the testes. These are all can also affect uh, fertility for men. For women, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, irregular ovulation, lack of ovulation, obviously, and lack of ovulation can be when the woman is too thin or uh, obese. Both of those uh, can cause ovulation to stop. Um, irregularities among the hormones that govern ultimately ovulation, stress is a huge factor in malnutrition. You also have this condition called PID or pelvic inflammatory disease. Uh, this is when the infection has caused um, scarring in the fallopian tissues and other organs possibly, uh, where if you remember from the picture of the fallopian tube, the egg is pretty big, so that it causes uh, the egg not to pass or impedes the sperm from uh, impregnating uh, the egg. So there are, thank God, infertility options. We have artificial insemination, in vitro fertilization. Uh, we have donor IVFs, um, surrogate mothers, and then adoption is always an option. So that's it for this chapter. Um, please feel free to email me with any questions or 